again to talk about the fact that Titian's work for the Este family in Ferrara, in particular Duke Alfonso's Este in Ferrara, led to his introduction to court circles. And this led to commissions for eroticized mythological pictures. It also led to a great interest in uh, Titian's portraits. And this uh, screencast will look at those portraits um, that we discussed down at the National Gallery. The first of the other courts for which Titian um, works is the Duke of Mantua, uh, right next to Ferrara as a duchy. Uh, both of these duchies border uh, on uh, the Republic of Venice. So let's look quickly at a map. Here, Venice is highlighted, and as you can see on the map, all the regions in pink are the Venetian Republic. Venice is ruled by Doge, and that Doge is elected from the uh, uh, the group of, of, of nobles uh, in Rome. Now, um, the Duchy of Ferrara is immediately south, borders right up against uh, the Venetian Republic, and the Duchy of Mantua is right next door to that. And again, um, surrounded really on three sides by the Venetian Republic. So, um, when he moves both to Ferrara and to Mantua, he's really just working for the neighbors um, immediately. Um, these regions are not elected governments. This is the old school feudalism idea where uh, Gonzaga would have inherited his realm from his uh, forefathers. Um, uh, there are other duchies here as well, the Duchy of Milan, the Duchy of Modena, uh, the Duchy of Savoy. All of these um, are, are part of this old feudal uh, uh, legacy. So Federico Gonzaga in Mantua actually inherited this title from his great-great-grandfather, uh, Ludovico Gonzaga, whose work we saw when we looked at Andrea Mantegna. Uh, there's the grandfather there, and of course, uh, as his great great grandfather um, uh, Federico uh, Gonzaga, of course, is not in this fresco. Um, as we heard before, uh, Gonzaga introduces um, Titian to his brother-in-law Francesco Maria della Rovere, uh, the Duke of Urbino, uh, just to the south of Ferrara. Uh, Again, uh, most marriages were arranged with the idea of linking these different courts, and so this is why Francesco Maria is married to uh, Federico Gonzaga's uh, sister. When we talk about the legacies and these old feudal uh, knighthoods, Della Rovere is a very, very prominent name. Um, Francesco Maria descended from a family line that included Pope Sixtus IV, who founded the Sistine Chapel, and Pope Julius II, who hired Michelangelo to decorate the Sistine Chapel. Uh, so Francesca Maria comes from a very long and distinguished line of art patrons. And it is for his son, Guido Baldo della Rovere, that the Venus of Urbino that we discussed in the other screencast was, uh, it was for his son that that was commissioned. Now, it was through these courts that Titian came into contact and eventually met the, and uh, became friends with, uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. Um, we see two portraits of him here. The first portrait Titian ever painted on your right, that amazing uh, dog, and then on the left on horseback, an uh, over-life-size portrait um, on horseback from the textbook. Um, Charles was born in Ghent in the Low Countries and had become Holy Roman Emperor in 1519. But he was only officially recognized by the Italian courts in 1530. And so in 1532, he comes to make a visit to his newly acquired Italian courts, who are now answerable to him as emperor. And it's at this point that Titian meets him and paints this very first portrait of him on the right. He visits him on a number of other different occasions uh, at various places in Europe. Um, Charles keeps a, uh, a palace in uh, the city of Augsburg. Um, the name Augsburg actually means imperial city, uh, comes from Augustus. And uh, Titian visits him there. That's where he paints the horseback picture on the left. 
uh, in Augsburg. Um, and as I mentioned before, Charles gave Titian knighthood uh, for his talents, made him a feudal lord. And this included retroactive nobility for all of Titian's family, which is really quite an honor, uh, something we have nothing similar to um, in our country. Now, his connections to Charles led to a long-standing connection with Charles' son, Philip II, who will inherit the kingdom of Spain from Charles when Charles steps down as Holy Roman Emperor in 1556. And it is Philip II who commissions from Titian a series of painted poetries that we discussed in the other screencast. Titian's work at court also brought him into uh, the orbit of the Pope, uh, Pope Paul III. Um, he met the Pope when the Pope was visiting Venice in the 1540s, but his reputation had preceded him, and the Pope certainly sought out uh, Titian. Um, Titian then is invited to come to Rome uh, to paint the Pope on a couple of different occasions. Um, here we see Pope Paul III twice over. Uh, on the left, uh, and then only a few years then on the right, and looking significantly more aged uh, at the time. Now, the Pope is from the powerful uh, Farnese family, Pope Paul III, and on the right we see him seated with two of his grandsons. Um, immediately to your left in the portrait on the right is Alessandro Farnese, one of the Car College of Cardinals in Rome, and dressed in his cardinal robes. And on the right, his other grandson, Ottavio uh, Farnese. Now, a bit about Paul III, and then a little bit more about Alessandro Farnese. Paul III was a, a reformer. He was the pope that was really instrumental in the Catholic Church mounting the Counter-Reformation, its answer to the Protestant Reformation. It was Pope Paul III that began the Council of Trent uh, that would define um, Catholicism for the next couple hundred years. It was Paul III that was behind the commissioning of the last judgment from Michelangelo for the Sistine Ceiling, um, where Christ appears very angry at sinners, turning his full attention to the sinners on the right and casting them away from him in judgment. This raises something of a paradox, because um, Paul III's grandson, Alessandro, here, is the one who commissions Titian's uh, eroticized mythological scene of Denia, plus another one showing uh, Venus and Adonis um, that's since been lost. So how do we rectify um, a pope interested in, in uh, reforming the church and, and a grandson, a cardinal no less, who's just as interested in really, uh, you know, painted versions of softcore porn. Um, this remains a paradox. I really have no answer for it whatsoever. Now, Paul III had a third grandson. We looked at him down at the National Gallery. Little Renuccio Farnese is the younger grandson of Alessandro and Ottavio, so he is uh, related directly to the Pope. This will lead to a series of very important appointments because, uh, because of his connection to the Pope. He becomes a member of the Knights of Malta, uh, whose robe he wears when he's only 12 years old. You'll notice the robe is oversized. It's, it's slouchy on his shoulders because it's not made for a child, but for an adult. Um, as early as age 15, he becomes a bishop as well. Um, all of these appointments coming through his grandfather, Pope Paul III. Titian painted his portrait, not in Rome, but probably back in Venice, uh, because this is where Renuccio Farnese was raised. Um, he was schooled in Padua, just nearby Venice, and spent quite a bit of time in Venice. And uh, the portrait that we're looking at, the one from the National Gallery, was actually commissioned by one of his guardians and educators to be given as a gift to his mother, the, the daughter of Paul III. Another church portrait that we saw down at the National Gallery is Pietro Bembo, um, another part of the papal circle, a member of the College of Cardinals in Rome, and you can see his costume is exactly identical uh, to the one worn by Alessandro Farnese. Um, this, however, was again painted while Titian was in Venice. Uh, 
Um, Dumbo was born and raised in Venice. His father had been a diplomat there, and he knew Titian before he moved to Rome. This portrait was painted between the time when he became cardinal in March of 1539 and his departure from Venice in October of that same year, and he probably took it with him to Rome uh, when he took on that new post. Now, it was a patron's father, Bernardo, who was a very important uh, diplomat in Venice and a poet and an art patron as well. So Pietro's works may be, this work, this portrait may well be in rivalry uh, with his father. Uh, the works that were commissioned by his father, two of them are actually in the National Gallery just by coincidence. Um, our Leonardo da Vinci portrait of Ginevra da Vinci was actually commissioned by Pietro Bembo's father, Bernardo Bembo, to be given to Ginevra on the occasion of her wedding. And we know from records that he also owned this wonderful uh, devotional image of St. Veronica by the Netherlandish artist Hans Memling. So we have quite a few works sort of related to the Bembo family. Uh, these from Bernardo and, of course, now Tisha's wonderful portrait of his son. We also at the National Gallery looked at this portrait of Vincenzo Capello. Uh, there's quite a few versions of this, and again, we've talked to quite a, bit, quite a number of times about Titian's, uh studio making crack, uh, copies of, of works of art. And uh, there are actually three identical versions of Vincenzo Capello and two more variations on the same portrait type. Uh, why all those copies would have been made is anyone's guess, but since he was a military leader, they may well have been made for people that uh, served under him. He was, um, as you might remember, the, uh, uh, the commander of the Venetian fleet. Um, each of the batons that we see is a, uh, a memorial symbol for one of his tours of duty as the head of the uh, Venetian fleet. He eventually served five tours of duty, so this is after the third um, of the five. Now, the portrait itself seems to be based on earlier portraits that Titian had done. We mentioned there were copies of this one of Capello, but the Capello portrait itself seems based on a certain level uh, on a type that he had first rolled out for Emperor Charles V. Uh, this portrait is now lost, but here's a copy by Rubens um, from a half century later where we see the same helmet on the shelf, uh, the man posed in armor, the same sort of color scheme as well um, for Emperor Charles V. After painting this portrait, I think uh, that inspired Titian to reuse it for others, and it certainly would have been welcome in anybody's uh, uh, collection to have a portrait modeled after uh, Titian's portrait of the Holy Roman Emperor. This is probably why uh, Francesco Maria della Rovere has a variation of the exact same pose. In fact, our Vincenzo Capello is closer to this, really, than even to the Charles, where, again, the helmet is on the shelf. We have batons leaning against the wall, um, and, again, that baton resting on his hip. But for Francesco Maria della Rovere, this was uh, uh, homage to his feudal overlord. Uh, the, the Holy Roman Emperor, whereas for Vincenzo Capello, I think Titian is simply reusing um, that portrait type for someone new. Um, interestingly here, uh, the batons against the wall, um, there's only one of them there, and then the other two sticks are in fact um, oak branches. And this is because the name Della Rovere means of the oak tree in Italian. So it's Francesco Maria of the Oaks, um, and he has oak symbols behind him as symbols of his family lineage. Now, finally, at the same time he was serving these different courts uh, throughout Europe, um, the Papal Court, the Holy Roman Imperial Court, uh, various others. He's also obviously the official painter to the city of Venice. This is why he did Vincenzo Capello, the uh, the captain of the Venetian fleet, but also why he hired to paint portraits of the different doges. Uh, usually on their election, he would paint a portrait of them uh, when elected. Our portrait, however, is a posthumous portrait. Uh, Andrea Gritti had died in 1538. And so in order to paint this, as we talked about downtown, he turned to Titian's earlier portraits of 
Andrea Griti, including some that came from his own shop. So here you can see the face is based almost directly on this, maybe made to look a little bit older. But you'll notice uh, that the body turning is, is, is in the original, uh, turned the same direction as the face. And Titian in the posthumous portrait has enlivened that by making him face one direction and march the opposite way. Still, in each of them, you can see that, that famous verse um, that Andrea Greedy has that we talked about when we were downtown.